U.S. tech companies are getting in trouble for how they do business in China. But can anything make them change their ways? Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. It hasn't been a great week for U.S. tech companies that do business in China. The Washington Post reports that Apple is lobbying against a bill that's aimed at stopping forced labor in China. Now, I don't want to be unfair to Apple. So to be clear, they're not trying to prevent the bill on stopping forced labor in China from being passed. That would look really bad. According to two congressional staffers, Apple is just trying to water down the bill. That's much better. The bill in question is the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. It passed the House of Representatives earlier this year and is currently in the Senate. In a nutshell, the bill stops U.S. companies from using forced labor from the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang. It also requires the U.S. government to use diplomatic actions and sanctions to try to stop the practice and punish the people involved. Now, it's already illegal to import products to the U.S. made with forced labor. But it still happens all the time. Chinese dissidents have said they were forced to work in prisons and labor camps to make products like Christmas lights and Homer Simpson slippers that were exported to the West. There have been several cases where notes from Chinese prisoners were found in items sold in the U.S., like a purse bought at Walmart a Saks Fifth Avenue shopping bag, and most famously, Kmart Halloween decorations. Which is why I do all my shopping at Jmart. So how do products made with Chinese forced labor get sold in the U.S. even though it's illegal? Well, enforcement of the law is lax. And many U.S. companies may not really know what's happening in their own supply chain. For example, Prisons that use forced labor have a sister factory that coordinates the prison manufacturing. Sister factories will use a commercial name for outside trade, intentionally mislabeling products that are made in prisons. So basically, Chinese prisons work with a front company to disguise the fact that the products are made with prison labor. Sure, U.S. companies could probably figure this out with a little more investigation into their supply chains, but they're not exactly incentivized to look into it very hard. That's something the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act would change. One provision in the bill requires public companies to certify to the Securities and Exchange Commission that their products are not made using forced labor from Xinjiang. If companies are found to have used forced labor from the region, they could be prosecuted for securities violations. So, companies like Apple would face serious legal consequences if their supply chains used Uyghur forced labor. You can see why Apple would be interested in watering down this bill. Of course, in a congressional hearing earlier this year, Apple CEO Tim Cook said that Apple would not tolerate forced labor. Let me be clear, forced labor is abhorrent. And we would not tolerate it in Apple. Cook also said that Apple would terminate any relationship with a supplier that was found to use forced labor. And an Apple spokesperson said that the company conducted a detailed investigation with our suppliers in China and found no evidence of forced labor on Apple production lines. Okay, great. Sounds like Apple has nothing to worry about. So why are they trying to water down this bill? I'll tell you after this commercial break. Welcome back. If Apple says they don't use forced labor, then why are they trying to water down a bill that would punish companies for using forced labor? Well, back in March, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute published a report that found at least four companies in Apple's supply chain had brought in Uyghur workers from Xinjiang through a government-sponsored labor transfer program. In some cases, Uyghurs were sent straight from detention camps to factories through this program. And Uyghur workers who have been able to leave China and speak out describe the constant fear of being sent back to a detention camp in Xinjiang or even a traditional prison while working at the factories. Apple suppliers that used Uyghur labor include Ofilm, 
a company that makes selfie cameras for iPhones. Well, that explains why my iPhone selfies always have that weird note in the background. Apple supplier Ofilm had over a thousand Uyghurs sent from Xinjiang to work at one of their factories. Uyghur workers were also transferred to a Foxconn factory in Zhengzhou. That Foxconn factory makes half of the world's iPhones. So how does this square with Apple's claims that they found no forced labor in their investigation? Well, if you go back and look at the Apple spokesperson's statement, he technically said that they didn't find any evidence of forced labor on Apple production lines, not in the factories as a whole. Plus, who's to say these Uyghurs were forced to work at these factories? I mean, according to Chinese state-run media, the workers at one of the Apple suppliers were there on an internship. That's not forced labor. And another Chinese state-run media report on Uyghur workers, including those at the O-Film factory, said that they were creating a happy life with their hard-working hands. Does that sound like forced labor? And here's a state-run media fact check. There's no such thing as forced labor in Xinjiang because all Xinjiang employees have chosen to seek employment elsewhere of their own free will. And the workers will turn into people who understand the party's blessing, feel gratitude toward the party, follow the party, and contribute to stability, also in a totally unforced way. But despite claims by state-run media that everyone is totally happy and unforced, this is still a problem for Apple and other U.S. companies that make products in China. Now that the Chinese Communist Party has started transferring Uyghurs from Xinjiang to the rest of China as forced labor, it's going to be tougher for U.S. companies to prove that they don't have any forced labor in their supply chains. And if the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act becomes law, U.S. companies are going to face real consequences. I'll explain after the break. Welcome back. If the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act becomes law, American companies could face consequences in the U.S. for using forced labor in China. Of course, this doesn't just affect Apple. And it's not just Apple lobbying against this bill. Some companies have lobbied to have their names removed from the bill because it calls out specific brands like Patagonia, Coca-Cola, and Costco for allegedly using forced labor from Xinjiang. What? No, not Costco. Now where am I going to get my five-gallon tubs of Kirkland Signature Ranch dressing? Forget ethnic minorities being forced to work under dehumanizing conditions. This is the real tragedy. To be fair to Apple, they have done some things related to stopping labor abuses in China. Earlier this month, they put a contractor on probation for allowing student laborers to work night shifts and overtime and do work unrelated to their fields of study and then covering it up. So if Apple is willing to put a supplier on probation because students were working overtime, why haven't they said anything about their contractors that use Uyghur forced labor? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it's too politically sensitive for Apple to talk about the Uyghur issue, especially since it's an official Chinese government program that places Uyghurs in these factories. So on one hand, if Apple doesn't address the problem of Uyghur forced labor and this bill passes, they get in trouble with the U.S. government. But if they do address the problem, they get in trouble with the Chinese Communist Party. Awkward. Apple lobbying against this bill makes more sense now. You know, the fundamental issue here is that U.S. companies aren't used to facing consequences for their actions in China. It's been an especially glaring problem for tech companies in the last couple of years. And not just ones that make products in China. Tech companies who sell products to China are also getting in trouble. Earlier this week, a New York Times investigation called out U.S. chip makers Intel and NVIDIA because their computer chips power a huge surveillance center in Xinjiang. The computers inside the center are so powerful that they can watch more surveillance footage in a day than one person could in a year. And in case there was any question over why this computing center is processing so much surveillance footage, 
Two data centers run by Chinese security forces sit next door, a way to potentially cut down on lag time, according to experts. Also nearby are six prisons and re-education centers. Chips made by Intel and NVIDIA, the American semiconductor companies, have powered the complex since it opened in 2016. I know that looks bad. But both Intel and NVIDIA say they were unaware of what they called misuse of their technology. It totally wasn't their fault then. I mean, they just sell the supercomputer chips. Are you expecting them to ask what the Chinese Communist Party would use their chips for? They probably assumed the Communist Party was building a giant supercomputer to send pictures of rainbows and puppy dogs to all its citizens. Well, apparently, the Trump administration hates puppy dogs. Because last year, the Trump administration banned the sale of advanced U.S. technology to Chinese companies over national security and human rights concerns. One of the companies that was blacklisted was Sugon, the Chinese company that Intel and NVIDIA sold their chips to. Sugon helped build the supercomputing center, and even boasted of the center's ties to the police. And Sugon even said that their computers had upgraded the thinking from after-the-fact tracking to before-the-fact predictive policing. Predictive policing. That doesn't sound creepy at all. Since the Trump administration's ban on selling advanced tech to Sugon, Intel and NVIDIA have stopped selling Sugon their advanced semiconductor chips, the one used for supercomputers. But both companies still sell less advanced chips to Sugon. A spokesman for Intel said it would restrict or stop business with any customer that it found had used its products to violate human rights. Really? Well, forgive me for being skeptical, but it's not the first time that Intel has been called out for its involvement in China's massive surveillance state. Last year, the Wall Street Journal published a report about how U.S. companies, including Seagate Technology, Western Digital, Intel, and Hewlett Packard, have nurtured, courted, and profited from China's surveillance industry. That includes things like selling chips and hard drives to Chinese surveillance companies, or even investing in Chinese tech companies linked to the police. Seagate boasted that they worked with Chinese surveillance company Hikvision to create the world's first hard disk drive specifically for surveillance. Although Seagate took that claim off their website last year for some reason. And according to the Wall Street Journal, Intel provided seed money as well as chips and technical solutions to a Chinese company called NetPosa that serves police departments in more than 60 Chinese cities, as well as the Ministry of Public Security. NetPosa is also heavily involved in surveillance in Xinjiang. When confronted, all of these companies either didn't respond or tried to squirm out of it. I'll show you what they did after the break. Welcome back. American tech companies love selling products to the China market. They just don't like it when they're exposed for helping the Chinese Communist Party become more authoritarian. Western Digital, which sold hard drives to several Chinese security companies, said that it recognized the gravity of the allegations that its products contributed to mass surveillance in Xinjiang. But hey, it didn't sell directly to the Chinese government. Several companies said that they were complying with U.S. law. Intel said that its products are used by customers worldwide for a variety of applications. Basically, when they were caught, these U.S. tech companies have tried to apply what this foreign policy article calls one company, two systems. Think of when Zoom tried to justify censoring Zoom calls that commemorated the Tiananmen Square massacre when there were Chinese citizens on the call because that violated Chinese law. Or when Google tried to justify Project Dragonfly, their censored search app for China, by saying that they had to censor to follow Chinese law. But when companies go for one company, two systems, they're really choosing the Chinese Communist Party's system. Because the U.S. government hasn't imposed a steep cost to companies that violate U.S. law or American values when they do business in China. But the Chinese Communist Party has imposed a very steep cost on U.S. companies that cross them. In the last two years, the Trump administration has started to change the game, 
with actions like banning U.S. companies from selling their technology to Chinese tech companies, and actually punishing China for its human rights violations. But tech companies are fighting the U.S. government as it imposes these costs. Even as lawmakers are telling tech companies they have to pick a side. Should the U.S. government be the one forcing tech companies to stop using forced labor, or to stop selling their technology to China's surveillance state? Is it possible for U.S. companies to realize themselves the moral cost of dealing with China, or even that it undermines their own self-interest? After all, if China reverse-engineers those supercomputer chips and becomes a world leader in semiconductors, they're not going to need Intel and NVIDIA anymore. For now, it seems like U.S. tech companies won't change their China business practices unless they're forced to by the U.S. government, or unless they get such bad publicity that they have to stop, like with Google's Project Dragonfly. You know, I think I need that supercomputer filled with rainbows and puppy dogs right now. And now, it's time for me to answer a question from one of you, a fan who supports China Uncensored on Patreon. Kara Fulton asks, and now, what can we do to stop this atrocity? Ah, that was in response to the episode Six Signs That Show China's Organ Harvesting Is Real. Now that's a great question. The Chinese Communist Party has been killing prisoners of conscience and selling their organs for decades. And sadly, there's been very little pushback from the international community. So what can you do? Well, for one, tell people about it. It's not exactly the best icebreaker at parties, but part of the reason many people don't know about it is because the mainstream media doesn't cover it. When more people know about it and speak out about it, that will force the U.S. government to respond. And the more vocal the U.S. is about it, the more likely China will actually have to deal with the issue. So call your representatives and tell them you want them to condemn forced organ harvesting in China. Thanks for your question, Kara. And thank you, as always, for watching. We're in an information war with the Chinese Communist Party, and knowledge is the best weapon. YouTube has been hitting us with demonetization a lot again. So help us in our fight to bring truthful, uncensored information about China to the world. Join the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army on Patreon, and for as little as a dollar an episode, you can help us keep up the fight. And you'll be able to ask me questions I might answer on the show. Visit patreon.com slash China Uncensored to join. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.